Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Abby. I'm really happy that there's a new generation of weirdos out there to follow me. My first awareness of the art space movement came in 1975 when I would attend performance art events at the Institute for Art and Urban Resources. Alana Heiss, who had worked for the Municipal Arts Society, founded IAUR to utilize vacant city-owned spaces in New York. One of these was called the Idea Warehouse, where I saw Virginia Pearsall roller skating around the vast loft on Reed Street in Lower Manhattan. She was wearing two eight millimeter film projectors secured to the front and back of her body with a harness, such that the images projected on the walls would get larger and smaller as she skated around. Alana also pioneered the clock tower, a space at the top of a building on Leonard Street in Broadway, where Gordon Matta Clark was famously filmed taking a bath while hanging off the clock face. Alana shocked the art world by opening an art space in an abandoned public school in Long Island City, Queens. PS1. This was well before it was cool to go and see art in the outer boroughs of Williamsburg, Bushwick, or Bed-Stuy, although Stefan Eintz had pioneered fashion moda in the Bronx in the late 1970s. Alana didn't want to compete with Saturday openings in Manhattan, so she opened on Sundays and hired buses to schlep people to Queens. In 2003, the whole PS1 organization was sucked up the ass of MoMA and is now known as MoMA PS1. Alana herself was the director. Do you want me to get closer or farther away? Uh-oh. Uh, Alana herself was the director of, of uh, this hybrid art space at first, but after her seven-year contract was not renewed, she founded Art on Air, an online radio station in the clock tower. Up on Green Street in Soho, Jeffrey Liu bought a building at 112 Green Street and invited artists to do anything. So George Trakas chopped a hole in the floor, restoring it after his show. This space became white columns after it moved to a building with white columns, and then to a building without any columns. The punchline is, that art spaces were using the properties of the architecture of Lower Manhattan as part and parcel of their work, as art spaces across the country were exploiting their local real estate conditions. I decided to found a not-for-profit organization because at this time in the 1970s, there was a moral distinction between the young art space movement and the established commercial gallery system. The art spaces were showing unsaleable video, film, performance, and installation art, while the commercial galleries were showing prints, photographs, painting, and sculpture. It was a big deal when Leo Castelli started selling videos by Bruce Nauman for big money. This was viewed as an incursion into our territory, but it also put a value on ephemeral art practice. By the 1980s, the gallery system had completely appropriated installation. The art world declared painting to be dead, and every self-respecting gallery showed installation in the front but sold prints out of the back to pay for it. We, as a field, can be very proud of having contributed installation art to the broader discourse. In those days, we had no written contract with the artists. They got paid a split of the door 
and I was the primary documentarian of Franklin Furnace events. Performance art was regarded as a means of protest against art as saleable as a nice picture that could be hung over a couch. By the 1980s, a few things had changed. Performance artists figured out that in order to obtain grant money, they had to submit videotape. Video technology had not become cheaper exactly, but artists were more willing to do whatever it took to make a three-quarter inch color umatic tape. At the end of the 90s, as a result of the culture wars, the work of especially performance artists became politically impossible. And as everyone here knows, the Individual Artist Fellowship Program of the National Endowment for the Arts was killed off. Meanwhile, back in the 1970s, the art spaces were applying to the National Endowment for the Arts Visual Arts Program headed up by Brian O'Dowerty. A performance and installation artist himself, as well as a critic, painter, and ex-medical doctor, Brian had written an essay in Art Forum entitled The White Cube, which examined how artworks were comprised of the artist's intention in the context of space. The workshop program at the NEA grew up to be the Artist Spaces program. When I started Franklin Furness with my own money and unemployment insurance, I didn't even know what a budget looked like until Bob Stearns, director of the kitchen during the 1970s, showed me his NEA application. Art spaces changed as the field evolved. The kitchen had been founded by Stena and Woody Vasulka in 1972 as a center for video art, a new field spawned by the invention of the porta pack in the mid 1960s. By the 1970s, it was showing performance art, new music, dance, video, and installation art. Now in Chelsea, the kitchen additionally has a robust exhibition program. Again, as a field, we can be very proud of having contributed performance art to the broader discourse as well. At the end of the 90s, Franklin Furness went through a period of re-evaluation of our purpose on the planet, and in the wake of the culture wars, we decided to go virtual. During Franklin Furness's 20th anniversary season, we mounted our last exhibition in physical time and space, entitled In the Flow, Alternate Authoring Strategies, curated by Daniel Georges. This exhibition examined how, during the past two decades, art had changed from solid painting and sculpture to liquid, interactive works that fundamentally question the role of the artist as sole author and were created through collaboration. At the same time, we were asking ourselves where freedom of expression was going to be possible in the future and decided that cyberspace was, for the time being, that free zone. Franklin Furness went virtual on February 1st, 1997, taking our website, franklinfurness.org, to be our public face. Most of us are not-for-profit corporations because this is how we can get grant money. CAVE, a collective of artists living and working in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, was an unincorporated association until the Rockefeller Foundation called one day, wanting to give them money for their performance program. They became not-for-profit in a giant hurry. But not-for-profit status is not the only game in town. It was announced on October 11th that Third Ward, the Brooklyn Art Design and Educational Workspace, where for seven years students and artisans have built wood furniture, learned about photography, and pursued other creative endeavors in Bushwick and with an out, in an outpost in Philadelphia, is closing. This is a for-profit collective workspace that went to investors hoping to raise $1.5 million for operating costs Plus, they ran a crowdsourced fundraising drive, all to no avail. 
What I got from the article in the New York Times was that the landlord raised the rent beyond what it was profitable for the owner, Jason Goodman, to pay. Recently, in an article in the Wall Street Journal, it seems more arts groups face upheaval. The Clock Tower Gallery, an art exhibition space founded in 1972 within the McKean, Mead, and White building at 108 Leonard Street, will vacate its space in late November. The previously city-owned property is being redeveloped as luxury residential real estate, according to a spokesman for the developer, Peebles Corp. Clock Tower's founder, Alana Heiss, said its programming and exhibitions will be continuing and the organization will be based in another art space to be announced later. Things change and organizations in the arts have to change with them, said Ms. Heiss. New York City Opera filed for bankruptcy court protection this month. Dance New Amsterdam, a studio and performance space in Tribeca, will close Sunday night after years of financial trouble due to an unsustainable lease. Nearby Space on White, which 2009 had rented its four studios to emerging arts groups, said Tuesday that it will rent the entire facility to a family-owned arts and crafts studio. We are not in good shape as a field, said Ruby Lerner, president and executive director of Creative Capital. While research in specific arts genres shows high activity among the smallest arts groups, which have low overhead and flexibility, the question is centered on growth. It's the mid-size organizations, such as City Opera, that may be the most at risk, said Adam Hutler, executive director of Fractured Atlas, an art service organization. We are going to see the big institutions get bigger and stronger and the little organizations and projects continue to pro proliferate, he said. I fear the mid-sized organizations are going to get squeezed. In Huey Copeland's article on Theaster Gates in the October issue of Art Forum, he writes, Gates is a business artist for the new millennium, which is to say a development artist, an entrepreneurial creator of public-private partnerships. When we read more deeply about this, Gates and his collaborators hire and train local laborers to refurbish buildings that then serve as cultural hubs all of which are funded by granting organizations and by the transformation of detritus from the sites into saleable art objects. Again, in the words of Huey Copeland, Gates aims to grab hold of what Clement Greenberg once famously called the umbilical cord of gold, connecting artists and their patrons, and to redirect it in the services of creating new communities, discursive platforms, and networks that have a tentacular reach. Ah, but here is where the canker gnaws. It seems to me that as not-for-profit corporations, we are forever moored to foundation money and must therefore mind what the funders want us to be doing. To have some source of unrestricted general operating revenue in 2008, Franklin Furness commissioned Tom Otterness and subsequently other Franklin Furness alums to produce an edition of works that we could sell at the Armory Show, not at Miami, not at New York, art fairs. What a pain it is, as some of you already know, to serve both the non-commercial and the commercial art gods. Hopefully we will have a chance at this conference to strategize our permanent dilemma together. But I want to end on a brighter note by taking a long view. At the end of the day, our history is being preserved by the Art Spaces Archives Project, a nonprofit initiative founded by a consortium of alternative organizations, including Bomb Magazine, the College Art Association, Franklin Furness, New York State Council on the Arts, New York State Artist Workspace Consortium, and Skowhegan School. 
ASAP has a mandate to help preserve, pre present, and protect the archival heritage of living and defunct for and not-for-profit spaces of the alternative or avant-garde movement of the 50s to the present throughout the United States. Their website is as-ap.org, and here you may submit your mission statement and an organizational profile such that researchers in the future may be able to find your organization and add your invaluable practice to social, cultural, and political discourse. A couple of parting thoughts. Cabaret Voltaire existed for five months in Zurich, but changed art history anyway. NAO, the National Association of Artist Organizations, with which some of us were involved, included the, the it's not a term, the, included the idea of nay in its title. The field is a better name for a heterogeneous group that will nevertheless, through process, arrive at a consensus as to what we can do in our current economic, political, and social context. The end. Thank you.